Courtship and Marriage. Welcome. It's another look into the life and message of Elizabeth Elliot, who called us to live to a higher standard each day. To not be satisfied with just throwing a little religion into life. As our series continues in the coming weeks, we'll hear from family, friends, and others who were influenced by Elizabeth's life and message. So let's consider what we're going to do today. We're going to wrap up a 10-part series on appreciation for men as we look at courtship and marriage. We'll be hearing both from Elizabeth and her brother, Jim. He'll talk about how Elizabeth was a letter writer and an encourager. And if you've ever wondered about her opening lines, is there a biblical reference for those? Loved with an everlasting love? Hear about that later. First, though, it's part nine of our 10 part series on appreciation for men moving toward marriage. You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says. And underneath are the everlasting arms. This is your friend, Elizabeth Elliot, continuing my programs in appreciation of men. We talked about how a man ought to move toward marriage. And I have a fascinating story to read today about how Tom Griffith moved toward marriage. This is what he says, I married late at 33. This was approximately 12 years after the time I first wanted to get married. 12 years doesn't seem so long now, but then it seemed an eternity. For about half of those 12 years, I tried the world's way of getting married. Not being a Christian, I assumed the burden of finding a wife was entirely my own. I never had the stomach for singles bars and computer matchups and that sort of thing, but I was ever the eagle-eyed hunter. Whatever business each day involved, a part of my attention was always given to the hunt. Was this the day? Was she the one? Should I have started a conversation? Should I have pressed her for a date? This approach created much anxiety and regret. I was haunted by the thought of missed opportunities or of not having exerted myself enough. Even when an acquaintanceship got going, it gave little satisfaction since I could tell pretty soon that it wouldn't lead to marriage. What it did often lead to was emotional entanglements, false hopes, and bruised hearts. By 26, I was getting nervous as one after another my friends got married and started families. Then various providences brought me to Massachusetts, where I became a Christian and was baptized. When the church's view of courtship and marriage was explained to me, I was flabbergasted. What? Stop hunting? Stop dating? Just leave it to God and pray? And go through a minister? Accustomed as I was to going after what I wanted, this seemed almost a cop-out. It was too passive, practically un-American. Yet it also had an appeal, especially as I observed the happy families of those who had gone that route. There seemed to be some proof in the pudding, and I ventured to try it. At first, it brought a marvelous sense of relief. For the first time in years, I relaxed, letting go and letting God. I fully believed that he wishes to grant us the desires of our hearts. I'd waited this long, I could wait a little longer for the perfect wife God had in store for me. Then, as lonely weekend followed lonely weekend, my resolve began to weaken. I had a good job in a new circle of Christian friends. I even lived with a godly couple who tried to disciple me. But the old man in me began to kick at the new constraints. After all, didn't God help those who helped themselves? Wasn't this waiting for heaven's choice a little extreme? The upshot was that I decided to cheat. I went through the cycle one more time, till conscience gnawed and my relation to God withered. I finally broke free after a timely warning from a minister. Then, leaving behind more hurt feelings, I moved closer to fellowship with the church people for my own protection. Subsequent years were spiritually rich and emotionally rocky. By 32, 
being single had become my quiet obsession. I didn't discuss it much, but had begun wondering if God wanted me never to marry. The prospect tormented me. I recognized that many single people seemed fulfilled and happy, that Scripture endorsed either condition and even seemed to give an edge to singleness, that great works of faith had been accomplished by the unmarried, not least by Jesus himself. But still, I wanted to get married. If lifelong bachelorhood was to be my cross, I wasn't sure I could bear it. Each passing year deepened the sense of isolation, of deficiency, of not fitting in. I found myself half wishing I were a Catholic. At least those in religious life who never married got some spiritual credit. And he's got quotation marks around credit. But to be Protestant and single just meant feeling left out. Even as anxiety deepened, God planted a name in my ear. It was of someone who, on the face of it, seemed highly unsuitable. The gaps of age, background, experience were too great. Yet the thought wouldn't go away. God had acted likewise with the young lady. It finally came out, and we were swept together in what felt like an arranged marriage. Arranged by God. I never sensed his will so clearly, and his choice was vindicated by a union so blissful that a description of it would sound gloating. For me, the most striking lesson of it was the superiority of God's timing to mine. My wife, revealed daily as an ideal partner, is 12 years younger. At the time I felt ready to marry, she was in the fourth grade. It wouldn't have done. And so I had to wait. Of course, I didn't know that at the time. Like Job, I saw only my immediate woes. Lacking God's perspective, I kicked against the pricks. We're told to trust. Given examples of his faithfulness in both Scripture and our own lives, and yet how easily we forget and begin to doubt him. My advice to singles who want to marry is hang on. Don't despair of God's resources, so infinitely greater than ours. Don't limit his capacity to bring a mate out of nowhere when the pool of candidates seems small and hopeless. Don't chafe at Scripture's stress on waiting to know God's will in the matter. He has a will for you, whether you follow it or not. When you get ahead of God and try to force things, the consequences are often tragic. The statistics tell the tale. So do the personal cases we all hear of misfired romances and wretched marriages. The way of courtship I learned in our church, as unusual as it seems in these times, appears to me to be God's answer to today's confusion. Those who grew up understanding these things do not always appreciate them and often take sound and happy marriages for granted. They may hanker for a more normal approach, whereas those of us who have tried normality can testify to its inadequacy. In the end, of course, none of us can assure the happiness of anyone else, nor can we just glibly urge patience on single people, since it may not be God's will for them to marry. But we can comfort one another and give mutual encouragement in the acceptance of that will. Whether we're single or married, life will bring sorrows. But our touchstone of joy remains the steady bearing of a yoke that is in the long run easy and light. Let me read that last sentence again. Whether we're single or married, life will bring sorrows. But our touchstone of joy remains the steady bearing of a yoke that is in the long run easy and light. Well, thank you, Tom Griffith. This is a man who had written this article in a magazine called Times of Restoration. I was fascinated by it and asked if I might be allowed to use it. And so I'm very grateful for that story. I want to encourage any young man who might be listening now, maybe it's an old man, maybe it's even a codger, somebody who would like to get married. Read 
Psalm 25. That's one of the great psalms that deals with God's guidance. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. In you I trust, O my God. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame, but they will be put to shame who are treacherous without excuse. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are God my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Remember, O Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you are good, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful for those who keep the demands of his covenant. For the sake of your name, O Lord, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. Who then is the man that fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the way chosen for him. He will spend his days in prosperity, and his descendants will inherit the land. The Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. My eyes are ever on the Lord, for only he will release my feet from the snare. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart have multiplied. Free me from my anguish. Look upon my afflictions and my distress and take away all my sins. See how my enemies have increased and how fiercely they hate me. Guard my life and rescue me. Let me not be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness protect me because my hope is in you. That's Psalm 25. Why not find it in your Bible and read it again? Moving Toward Marriage, part two of this uh, short series within the Longer Appreciation for Men series. We have one more coming up in just a little bit, and the topic is courtship. What exactly is courtship? Hear about that later. First, though, we get to hear from Jim Howard, one of the brothers of Elizabeth. It seems that uh, his older sister was a letter writer, and it was a way to encourage her younger brother, Jim. Sensitivity to others' needs, her her, uh, concern to reach out and to bring words of comfort and encouragement where she could. And uh, that was very important in my life as I went up through high school and college days and faced some of the struggles that most of us in our young days have. And she would keep in touch with me by letter. She would write longhand letters of encouragement. And when I became married to my wife, Joyce, to whom I was married for 60 years, uh, my sister was at our wedding 60 years ago. And she followed us. By by that I mean, when she saw us in a time of special need or uh, struggling with some issues that we might be facing, she would write letters of encouragement and give us promises of Scripture that helped us through some of those difficult times. And so both Joyce and I were very grateful for that. Jim Howard, younger brother of Elizabeth Elliot. Over the years, maybe you've heard Elizabeth talk about being loved with an everlasting love, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Is there a biblical reference for that? Stay tuned a little bit later and hear about that. Right now, we wrap up our series, Appreciation for Men, by looking at courtship. My father was an amateur ornithologist, loved birds, and had been studying birds ever since he was 16 years old. And I remember his telling us that the Arctic tern finds its way over 12,000 miles of ocean, 
from its nesting grounds in the Arctic to its wintering grounds in the Antarctic. Ornithologists have conducted all sorts of tests without finding the answer. Instinct is the best they can offer. There is no explanation at all, and I think, frankly, that the word instinct used by a scientist is merely a way of saying that they really have no idea how it works, how that bird finds its way over 12,000 miles of ocean. A Laysan albatross was once released 3,200 miles from its nest in the Midway Islands. Now listen to this. It was back home in 10 days. 3,200 miles in 10 days. That's 320 miles a day. William Cullen Bryant has a beautiful poem called To a Waterfowl. I'll read part of it. Well, first of all, let me tell you that this poem was written when William Cullen Bryant himself was forlorn and desolate and wondering how in the world he was ever going to find a job as a lawyer. In 1815, this was in Plainfield, Massachusetts, and it was at sunset when he saw a solitary bird flying across the sky. And God spoke to him through that scene, and this is part of what he wrote. There is a power whose care teaches thy way along the pathless coast, the desert and illimitable air, lone wandering but not lost. All day thy wings have fanned at that far height the cold, thin atmosphere, yet stoop not weary to the welcome land, though the dark night is near. Thou art gone. The abyss of heaven hath swallowed up thy form. Yet on my heart deeply has sunk the lesson thou hast given, and shall not soon depart. He who from zone to zone guides through the boundless sky thy certain flight, in the long way that I must tread alone, will lead my steps aright. This is how God led Jonathan Goforth, who was a very well-known missionary in China. It starts out with the story of the woman he married. Rosalind Bell Smith, born in London in 1864, was 12 years old when she heard a sermon on John 3.16 at a revival meeting. The love of God was presented with such fervor and intensity that she yielded herself absolutely to Christ and stood up along with others to confess him publicly as her Lord and Master. Her father having been an artist, she grew up with a great love for art and went to art school in Toronto. But there was a strong pull in two opposite directions. Should she give her life to painting or should she serve the Master to whom she belonged? In her mind, the two were mutually exclusive. When she was 20, she began to pray that if married life was what God wanted for her, he would give her a husband wholly given up to him and his service. I wanted no other, she said. One day in June 1885, she joined a group of art students bound for a picnic at Niagara Falls. On the same boat was another party headed for a Bible conference. She envied the latter group, Her heart was more with them than with her own crowd. Returning that evening on the same boat were the two groups, plus others who had been there at the Bible conference. The Bible teacher recognized Rosalind as the organist in the church where he had spoken the previous Sunday and invited her to join a mission group the following Saturday. We're to have a workers' meeting and tea, and I would like you to meet them all, he said. She was on the point of saying that this was impossible when her brother whispered, You have no time. You're going to England. Partly to show her brother that she would do as she pleased, and what a trifle can turn the course of a life, she said later, she accepted the invitation on the spot. As the teacher turned to leave, he called to a friend who looked to Rosalind like a very shabby fellow. He was introduced as Jonathan Goforth, our city missionary. I forgot the shabbiness of his clothes, 
However, for the wonderful challenge in his eyes, she wrote, The following Saturday found me in the large, square workers' room of the Toronto Mission Union. Chairs were set all around the walls, but the center was empty. Just as the meeting was about to begin, Jonathan Goforth was called out. He had been sitting across the corner from me with several people in between. As he rose, he placed his Bible on the chair. Then something happened, which I could never explain, nor try to excuse. Suddenly, I felt literally impelled to step across, past four or five people, take up his Bible, and return to my seat. Rapidly, I turned the leaves and found the book worn almost to shreds in parts, and marked from cover to cover. Closing the book, I quickly returned it to the chair, and returning to my seat, I tried to look very innocent. It had all happened within a few moments. But as I sat there, I said to myself, that is the man I would like to marry. That very day, I was chosen as one of a committee to open a new mission in the east end of Toronto, Jonathan Goforth being also on the same committee. In the weeks that followed, I had many opportunities to glimpse the greatness of the man which even a shabby exterior could not hide. So when, in that autumn, he said, Will you join your life with mine for China? My answer was yes, without a moment's hesitation. But a few days later, when he said, Will you give me your promise that always you will allow me to put my Lord and his work first, even before you? I gave an inward gasp before replying, Yes, I will, always. For was not this the very kind of man I had prayed for? O oh, kind master, to hide from thy servant what that promise was going to cost. A few days after my promise was given, the first test in keeping it came. I had been, womanlike, indulging in dreams of the beautiful engagement ring that was soon to be mine. Then Jonathan came to me and he said, You will not mind, will you, if I do not get an engagement ring? He then went on to tell, with the greatest enthusiasm, of the distributing of books and pamphlets on China from his room in Knox. Every cent was needed for this important work. As I listened and watched his glowing face, the visions I had indulged in of the beautiful engagement ring vanished. This was my first lesson in real values. Dr. and Mrs. Goforth sailed for China in February 1888 and served there until 1935. He celebrated his 76th birthday on board ship, bound for Canada, where he died the following year. I remember often hearing my parents speaking about Dr. and Mrs. Goforth, and I did meet them when I was just a little child. One of the many great missionaries, great servants of God, whom my parents invited to our home and thereby provided us six children with the great privilege of seeing in the flesh examples of holy people, holy men and women. But since we're talking primarily to men this week, I do want you to notice that Dr. and Mrs. Goforth had absolutely no opportunities for intimacy before he proposed to her. They had hardly had conversations. There was no, well, what else shall I say than intimacy, whether physical or emotional or even conversational. They were in groups when they saw each other. They were never alone together, probably until the very moment when he proposed, and I'm not sure that he even arranged to be alone then. The point I'm making is that it's a great fallacy which has gained popular acceptance in today's world that you must experience intimacy with a person of the opposite sex before you can possibly know whether you would like to marry this person. What was it that drew each of them to the other? It was character. It was character. Rosalind saw in Jonathan a faithful, earnest servant of God 
who had set his face like a flint to do God's will. That was also the purpose of her heart, and God brought them together as only God knows how to do. Trust him to do it for you in his own time and in his own way. But it means waiting. It means silence. It means self-sacrifice. And the expectancy that God will indeed guide. May he help you to trust him for that. Well, that was called courtship. Part 10 in our series, the last in our series on appreciation for men. If you've listened to Gateway to Joy over the years, maybe you've heard these words many times. You are loved with an everlasting love, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Is that from the Bible? You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says. That verse, in fact, is to be found in Jeremiah 31, verse 3. And underneath are the everlasting arms. You can find that in Deuteronomy 33, 27. Those of you that listen to me know that I quote these two verses for you every day. Deb from the U.S. writes, I'm grateful for the life and obedience of Elizabeth Elliot. She challenges me to total surrender to Christ without shaming me for the struggle. Thank you for producing these podcast gems. Well, thank you, Deb, for taking time. And friend, uh, if you get a chance, leave us a review. Thanks. Well, as our time together comes to an end, let me thank you for letting us come into your home, your office, maybe along with you as you took a walk, wherever we found you today. And on behalf of the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation, in cooperation with the Bible Broadcasting Network, let me invite you to check out elizabethelliot.org. Elizabeth with an S, elizabethelliot.org for more talks, devotionals, videos, and more. Until next time, may God remind you daily that you are loved. With what? That's right, an everlasting love. Underneath are the everlasting arms. 